Fantastic. Great. All right. I think we can get started. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody, so much for being here today. Welcome to this webinar, Enduring Foundations, Bold Ambition. What arts and cultural policy settings does Australia need for the 21st century? I'm joining you today from Ngunnawal country and I pay my respects to First Nations elders, past, present, and to those First Nations joining, people joining us today. Here in the capital, federal parliament is sitting, the spring flowers are in full bloom and the pollen count is exceedingly high. My name is Kate Fielding, I'm the CEO of A New Approach. ANA is Australia's leading arts and culture think tank. We exist to make arts and culture evident and to help shape policy settings for a cultural life that emboldens us all. We do independent research and analysis and are philanthropically funded. You can find more information on our website, newapproach.org.au. Now with me today is ANA Chair Rupert Meyer, who you will hear from in a moment. And we'll of course be joined shortly by our panellists, Cara Kirkwood, John Daly and Joe Higgins, noting that unfortunately Jackie Bailey isn't able to join us today. But first, some housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on demand after the event. Today's event will include some opening remarks from ANA Chair Rupert Meyer, I'll give you a preview of ANA's new paper, which is coming out tomorrow, and then we'll move into the panel discussion with Cara, John and Joe, followed by an opportunity for the audience to ask questions. And you can submit a question via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Now with that, I'm gonna hand over to our ANA chair, Rupert Meyer. Thanks, Rupert. Look, thank you, Kate, and thanks uh, everyone. Uh, on this call for joining us today. I begin by acknowledging that I'm on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and, and our Indigenous participants on today's call. Um, I wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners and also to acknowledge the highly significant contributions <clears throat> to arts and culture uh, of Indigenous people. While it'd be inappropriate to begin without recognising the really difficult times in Australia for many, and of course, in the arts and cultural sectors specifically. Uh, today, we want to look across the valley <clears throat> and to the other side. Uh, today's occasion is an invitation to cast our minds to the future, to be thinking about real and practical ways we can support arts, culture, and creativity in Australia, and what we might be able to achieve as a nation. As we do so, we recognise the incredibly rich cultural inheritance that we share here in Australia. There are people from every single country on earth living here. This single phrase very powerfully illustrates that our cultural inheritance is both very deeply of this place through our, our Indigenous cultures and very much of the world. That is right at the heart of who we are. So today we have more than 350 people uh, joining us here on, on this call, we can see there's a real appetite from right across the country for this sort of discussion right now. I'd particularly like to welcome representatives from A New Approaches, philanthropic partners, board and reference group, as well as representatives from the various national, state and territory and local government departments and agencies, as well as the truly impressive range of cultural organisations and individuals from right across the country involved in all types of different arts and cultural activities. It's really very heartening and we, we think discussions like this are essential to make sure that people right across the country from all walks of life have the opportunity to participate in and contribute to our shared arts and cultural life. So with that, I'll hand back to you, Kate. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much, Rupert. So, Today is about discussing what we should be considering in creating fit for purpose policy settings for arts and culture. We have a unique opportunity to shape the change being driven by COVID-19. And I join Rupert in acknowledging that it's an incredibly difficult time, but we can use, we can shape that change and use strategic investment to transform and embolden our cultural landscape to serve our contemporary public. 
But to take up this unique opportunity to transform our policy settings, we need to talk about the future. We know that a lot of the conversation about arts and cultural policy settings is primarily focused on sector or industry policy, meaning what does a particular art form need? What does a particular part of the sector need? So it's really a supply side discussion and often focused on funding. ANA has been approaching this conversation about policy settings from a different angle, thinking about questions such as what are the benefits of a rich cultural landscape? What impacts do arts and culture have on people's lives? What are the attitudes towards arts and culture of middle Australians, defined as undecided voters from low and middle income households living in regional or outer suburban locations? How are arts and culture relevant and significant to them? How has creation, production, distribution and consumption changed? Are our policy settings keeping up? And what are the roles of governments in this space? What are the roles of industry, of institutions and of individuals? What is the role of other types of investment, including philanthropy and businesses? So tomorrow ANA is releasing a new paper titled 21st Centuries for Australian Arts and Culture Policy. And I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Jody Trembath as the co-author on that paper. This new paper draws some of the insights from our work with young and middle-aged middle Australians together, together with themes in cultural policy in Australia and across the globe. And it also takes what we've learned from tackling those big questions that I just read out. And it draws all those things together. The paper looks at foundations that have endured in our arts and cultural landscape, as well as the emerging trends. It outlines the prior priorities for change that we need to address through refreshed policy settings to ensure all Australians have opportunities to participate in and benefit from a vibrant cultural life. Now, the key priority for change in this paper is a national plan for arts, culture and creativity, because that would help us do exactly that, ensure all Australians have opportunities. We believe a national plan is a practical way for the Australian government to facilitate more coherent and effective investments, as well as more effective legislative, regulatory and policy settings. A plan would provide a strategic framework to help boost cultural expenditure by governments with a goal to exceed the OECD average within the next decade. I'm hopeful that the current parliamentary inquiry into creative and cultural industries and institutions will recommend the development of such a plan. So like today's discussion, the new paper is designed to help connect those different conversations together, designed to draw together public perspectives and policy perspectives into the conversations that the sector is having about the future. ANA thinks the time is right to create fit for purpose policy settings that will help us generate a rich cultural life for all people living here in this country. We don't have all the answers, but we do think that all of us here can play a part in building a better understanding of the role arts and culture has in the lives of Australians, of the benefits and of how we can foster a bold and ambitious cultural landscape. So a couple of things for today's discussion. We are working with an inclusive definition of arts and culture, inclusive of different art forms and craft and design, of screen, of gaming, of galleries, libraries, museums, archives, festivals. It's inclusive of all those things. It's inclusive of commercial activities, of the subsidised sector, of community activity and of professional activity, of people right across the country and what they do in the arts and cultural space. Today is designed to be expansive and exploratory, to spark ideas about the way forward. And with that, I'd like to invite our fantastic panel members to join and we can get started with some conversation. While they're joining, I'll remind you to sign up to ANA's mailing list on our website to ensure you're kept informed of the latest news, including tomorrow's release of the new analysis paper. And you can find us on Instagram and LinkedIn. So, on today's panel, we have Kara Kirkwood, who is a national advocate and influencer for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, art, culture, and creative industries. 
We have John Daly, who is one of Australia's leading policy thinkers and was chief executive of the Grattan Institute for its first 11 years. And we have Joe Higgins, who has worked in the museum and gallery sector for over a decade as an educator, public programmer and researcher, specialising in youth engagement and arts partnerships. Welcome to all of our panellists. Thank you. So each of our panellists have had a chance to read the new paper that's coming out tomorrow that explores what policymakers and middle Australians think about arts and culture and what they value. And I'm about to ask you, what do you think the arts and culture sector can learn from those insights? And Cara, would you like to kick us off in the discussion today? And excellent, excellent artwork there over your shoulder. <laughs> Um, yes, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Australia. Uh, there's nothing quite like the pollens here in, in the Ngunnawal neighbourhood and or a digital disruption this morning to get to the nerves flowing. Um, look, in relation to the first question I had, um, I took from it some of the learnings is that I think the sector can re retain some optimism. Um, I took the central implication that the creative industries are in fact valued right across the country. One of the things that I think I've been banging on about for quite some time now is that one of those challenges, of course, is about finding a shared language. Um, and that's between our sector and other sectors um, in the first instance, which I think will have the, the lovely flow on effect um, for this particular cohort that you're talking about uh, out of this paper. Um, and I think the other thing for me was that Middle Australia doesn't necessarily see art form as distinct from experience or entertainment. And that's something that I think we've got to be thinking about in relation to sort of future, what that future model and what should be involved in that cultural plan should, should look like. Excellent, thank you, Cara. And despite the pollen and technical difficulties, you've kicked us off with some really great inspiring comments there. Thank you so much. I'm going to throw now to John. So John, what do you think that art, the arts and cultural sector can take from this piece? So I think if you look at the history of arts policy in Australia for the last couple of decades, and of course, that's another paper that a New Approach has written, um, we've spent a lot of time talking about the economic value of arts and culture, about what it can do for educational outcomes, what it can do for health outcomes, what it can do for social outcomes, and it has all of these effects. But what we, I think, can take away from the paper is that um, for many people in Australia, the real point of the exercise is that art makes you happy. It, it helps you to understand the world and yourself and people around you, and it connects you to your society. It gives you a sense of identity as well. Um, and I think one of the things that we could perhaps take away from this paper is that we shouldn't put those justifications for art and culture in the background. Uh, when we appeal to them, we are actually appealing to something that people already believe uh, and that for many of them is the core reason that they care about art and culture. Excellent. Thank you, John. And Joe, I'm going to um, turn to you now. So drawing on that piece that explores what policymakers mm -hmm. and middle Australians think about arts and culture and what they value. Mm -hmm. What do you think the arts and culture uh, sector can draw from those insights? Look, for somebody that's worked in the arts and culture sector for a decade now, particularly in public programming, audience engagement, I think these findings are really emboldening, which is a word that you used before, Kate, because I think they present some really key opportunities actually for the sector. And I think, you know, there's a couple of things I think the sector could really do and, and learn from these. And I think one of them is really about, you know, revisiting these barriers that we perceive for there to be for broad parts of Australia that's stopping them from participating. Because as you just said, John, you know, there is this really nuanced, broad understanding of what arts and culture is and, and what it offers people in their everyday lives. So there are opportunities. And I think what was really interesting to me too is that these findings really reaffirm that people need to see their lives and experiences represented in our cultural offerings and institutions. So thinking about forms of participation and exchange and, you know, what that looks like and how we can actually invite people in to be part of those programming and conversations. So, I mean, we talk a lot about 
what the arts can offer young people, but I love talking about what young people can offer the arts. So uh, I think there's a lot of takeaways in here that are really optimistic, as you say, Cara. Thanks. Yeah, I think that um, that emboldening and that optimism that comes through uh, is definitely a really heartening thing. And I know particularly at the moment, uh, while we're in this, you know, very difficult time with COVID and the transitioning that's happening over the next few months with how that's being managed and, and what that will mean for live gatherings, for live events, for being able to congregate together. It's, um, it's really cheering um, seeing this material at the moment and going this is this is what um there's a real aspiration for the future here Kara, i'm going to circle back to you you were there was a lot of enthusiastic nodding there on the um the invitation and the participation can you sorry just repeat that Oh, sorry. Um, you were enthusiastically nodding on those themes of um, participation and the invitation uh, mm. there. And I just wanted to um, see if you'd like to comment on that. Yeah, I suppose I think about participation um, and invitation as, well, it's really about the participation. I think that it, it like you're saying, Joe. We know by all of the kinds of data sets that have been taken and collected across the country for at least 10 or so more years that everyone does participate. You know, a majority of Australians participate in some form of creativity. Um, I think the other thing that is kind of coming about is we're also starting to recognise, we recognise it as part of our national identity, we recognise it as part of our national brand, we um, kind of... As part of that, I think, with the disruptions, and this is probably going to come into your next question, Kate, I don't know. Um, but I think that also Australians are starting to recognise that there's a gap between what we need for future resilience and, and action and what we're kind of grappling with now. Um, and so I guess that's why I enthusiastically not around participation and invitation, because I think there is a collective sense of urgency from particularly the last two years has really, I think, amplified um, a, the value of the creative industries um, and b, the need and, and gap space within what we're going to require within workforces across every sector um, that I think creativity and creatives have to offer in that space. Um, that's my enthusiastic nod. Excellent. Thank you. John, do you want to pick up there on those ideas of resilience? Yeah, I mean, uh, if COVID's taught us anything, it's shown us just how important arts and culture are to our lives. Um, uh, you know, I think one of the things I found slightly surprising about the paper was the idea that the democratisation of arts and culture was a new trend. Uh, and I will confess I was a little puzzled by that. Um, you know, we don't know very much about Indigenous sport from 260 years ago, but we know an awful lot about Indigenous art and culture from 260 years ago, indeed, from 20,000 years ago, um, uh, probably much longer than that. Um, so, uh, you know, we um, every human society we know of, uh, arts and culture play a really big role, and they play a really big mass role. They always have. Now, it might be that we have tended to think of arts as, you know, rich people going to the opera, but the reality is that arts and culture are a part of, you know, the vast majority of Australians' lives, as Cara was saying. Um, and uh, we, you know, that's not new. Now, I think what is new is what Cara was talking about, uh, an increasing recognition of that. And I think ironically, we have an increasing recognition of indigenous arts and culture as part of national identity. I would suggest we actually don't have a huge amount of recognition of arts and culture in national identity more generally. Um, uh, you know, of our last five prime ministers, um, uh, Malcolm Turnbull went regularly to performances of the major performing arts group. The other four between them went once. Um, <laughs> Uh, whereas, you know, like they go to the football and the cricket all the time and they, you know, visibly post to their pages. Now, the irony, of course, is that that is completely unrepresentative of Australians' lives. So we know from the statistics that Cara was talking about that more Australians go to see live arts and culture than go to see live sport. We know that they spend more hours watching 
drama on television than they do watching drama, sport on television. We know that more of them make art and culture for themselves um, than actually play or participate in sport as you know, referees and all the rest of it. Um, so we have this enormous disjunction between our official identity, you know, like our symbols, what our prime ministers go to, um, and, uh, and what our actual people do. Now, as Cara was saying, I think that's finally breaking down a bit um, with Indigenous arts and culture. We've got a, a long way to go. Um, but I, I'm hoping that's a bridgehead head for a more general reevaluation of, you know, what does it mean to be Australian? Uh, and more to the point, what symbols do our leaders hold out? Because I think we've got this strange world in which the symbols that our leaders have and the idea of what they have in their heads that Australia is, is actually quite divorced from what Australians think their lives are. Now, it wouldn't be the first time that um, uh, Australians' public attitudes have um, got you know, well adrift from those of our politicians. You only have to think about the um, same-sex marriage survey to, to see just how far apart they can get. Um, but uh, I think that that is a trend that we are seeing. It's moving, but I think it's got a long way to go. Thanks, John. And Joe, you work with young people and obviously we're talking about attitudes and changing attitudes and, and the future. And while we um, wouldn't want to um, simply burden young people with thinking about the future, um, I am interested in um, hearing what you what you see, how those um, comments from John in terms of how attitudes are evolving and whether our politicians are keeping up with those attitudes, how you see that reflected um, in the work that you do in young, with young people. I think, look, not to generalise, but I think most young people would say that politicians are out of step with where they are thinking about everything from climate change to gender identity to the whole sort of spectrum, really, of, of conversations that people are having about, about identity, really. And I think that, you know, my experience of working with young people and engaging with programs overseas and really seeing the ways that, I mean, arts institutions particularly, but... Um, are engaging young people and inviting them in. And I think there's so much to be learned from, once you get over the initial terror, I think of working with young people, um, there is, there's a lot that can be really gained from them in terms of what they bring to these conversations around accountability and, and a real critical lens to like why this person and why this conversation and why this artist. And, and there's a real generosity, I think too, to a lot of that good trouble that they sort of set out to make. And, I think, you know, they are experts in their own lives and they are really, in terms of cultural currency, they really are, are at the front of new technologies, new ways of engaging, new ways of communicating. And, and I think there's a very um, kind of respectful questioning of why things are done the way that they're done, particularly in the sort of the art sector. That's been my experience anyway, with inviting young people in to... Um, yeah, to, to have a presence and to have a voice and then to, to navigate that with them has been really, but you know, I think about, um, there's a young art history TikToker, for instance, who's a young Australian woman called Mary McGillivray, who is really at this intersection of bright ideas and rigorous art history and TikTok. And, you know, there are all of these ways that I think if we let go of ways of doing things and ways of inviting people in and the roles that we think these different segments of, what, of our community need to play, there's all kinds of things that could happen that I think are really, um, are really exciting. And, and my experience of working with this generation of young people is that they are the most empathetic, activist, curious, you know, enthusiastic kind of people that we could be really listening to. So, I mean, it is their future, but it's also their today. So um, I think there's a lot of opportunities. And the research that ANA has done about that is really, um, really affirming. Well, let's circle back to that. This new paper that you've had a had a chance to have a look at talks about um, the enduring foundations of, of arts and culture in Australia, as well as some of the emerging trends and really is uh, positioning that both of these will need to be um, accounted for in a, a national approach to this space. And so I'd like to hear from each of you um, if there was something that was surprising or that something that was particularly resonated out of um, any of those foundations or those emerging themes. And uh, I'm going to um, start with you, John. 
Well, just to ensure that um, everyone doesn't think that I agree with everything in the paper, there was one I wanted to pick up on, which was around um, uh, copyright protection. Uh, so the paper quite rightly says that copyright protection is important. Uh, and it quite rightly says that um, uh, it needs to be balanced around against um, uh, the sort of uh, issues around identity and it needs to be balanced around um, uh, other things. But the thing that it didn't pick up on was the need to balance one artist's rights to their own work with another artist's rights to make new work. Uh, as Stravinsky very famously said, good composers don't borrow, they steal. Uh, and I think it's something that we really need to look at long and hard in Australia. I think that we have um, uh, got copyright protections in place, which in some cases are way over the top. Um, you know, there is no reason to protect um, uh, copyright 80 years after the death of the author. You know, there's not an awful lot of artists who make work for their children. There are very few who make work for their grandchildren. And I don't know any who make work for their great grandchildren in terms of making money out of it. They may well want them to keep it on the wall <laughs> or, uh, or whatever, but, um, you know, I think that we may well have gone too far. Now, of course, particularly in the Indigenous space, we need to be very careful about um, uh, work and uh, designs and uh, copyright ideas much more generally and the way that they are protected. But I do think that we need to remember that there is a balance and that one of the things that art does is that it builds on the shoulders of what we've inherited. And if our artists today say, I'm entitled to build on everything I've inherited, but no one else is allowed to build on my shoulders, then I think that we actually create, we, we sell the future short. And we see this on Amazon um, because, you know, one of the things that has happened is that essentially books that were written more than about 30 years ago, but less than 80 years ago, have become unobtainable. Um, and nobody reads them for that very reason, which I'm sure is the one thing that their authors would regret most. <laughs> um, uh, and it's essentially a consequence of copyright law. And as soon as books are out of copyright, everybody starts printing them and everyone starts reading them again. Excellent, John. You, of course, promised a bit of controversial and you've you've gone straight in there. The, the important and very, very tricky space of copyright. Joe, can you um, tell me if there is something that was um, out of those foundations or emerging trends that either surprised you or delighted you or in, enraged you, any of the feelings? Look, definitely uh, inspired. I think it really, a lot of them really affirmed my own experiences and reflections, particularly over the last three years, I think having spent some time overseas looking at different models of engaging young people in arts institutions, but also more generally in cross-sector kind of settings. Um, but also too, like working with a group of teenagers at MCA Australia during COVID and really seeing what that did uh, in terms of kind of really breaking the way that we had to work and all of these ways of thinking, oh, we should do this. And we, the ability with which the art sector responded to that and really showed the ways that we can think differently and we can mobilize and we can you know, with, without the institutions, without access to the art, you know, what, what do we stand for? And so that was really, there was a lot in that in terms of really recognising the role that, that arts and culture play to support young people. And I think a lot of the changes that COVID has accelerated, you know, have been around particularly the impact on young people and their mental health. And I think, you know, that certainly played out in my experiences of programming with young people responding in real time to these things and, and what that in turn led to. Um, and, you know, and there's now a lot of money that's being allocated to look at young people's mental health and well-being. And I think that the arts have a, have a contribution to make there. But I think for me, what was probably the most exciting in terms of my own research and advocacy and that, that soapbox that I like to get up on is really about this um, changing belief in arts and cultures, you know, the broader impacts of that, because I think, you know, the institutions have a role to play, but I think, you know, arts can contribute in so many different sectors and settings, and there are ways to take things like creative youth development models and put them into the justice sector and health and education, and I think to really see that people can understand that the arts is enmeshed in our lives and that there is an opportunity there, for me, um, I'm like ready to go. It's yeah, I'm, it's great. <laughs> 
Thank you, Joe. Uh, Cara, I'm going to hand to you now. Was there something in there in terms of those foundations, those enduring foundations, or the emerging trends that surprised, delighted, or enraged you? <laughs> My immediate answer when I was writing down some notes was no. Um, I didn't think there was anything that was shocking or too unusual. I think the thing for me, um, particularly in the foundations, there's a lot of um, talk or findings about First Nations um, positioning in that, um, the cultural heritage, uh, which all ties to our connection, belonging and our inheritance of what we are um, seeding. It goes back to our identity and our brand and all those things that touches into that copyright um, work that you're talking about, John, um, which I think all makes a great deal of sense to the foundations and that, that we know and that we know we need to have a, re a very um, relevant and vital kind of community around us, which at the core, of course, creative industries is, is central. Um, the emerging trends, I thought, the interesting tension I can see, I, I think when I read papers like this, I'm always thinking, well, what's that gonna mean in um, one, five and 10 years time was the changing role for public funding um, I think that within our sector, we're going to have some very robust conversations coming up about um, the role of fossil fuels. Um, what and where are the opportunities? Maybe there's there should be some massive opportunities in new models of partnerships with innovation, science, um, and all of those unspoken and untapped uh, kinds of partnerships at this point, which could mean something very exciting for our creatives, for our artists. Um, in working with what green energy looks like in a very big invested way. Um, so I think some of the things I was thinking about uh, sort of tapped into yours, Joe, around the changing beliefs of arts and cultures, broader impacts alongside the, that tension role around what, what role is public funding going to have um, into the future? I think, can I, to come back to, to that point about, um, you know, the changing role and that understanding of broader impact and I think there was something in the paper too around you know people are really wanting to they want that value for money and they want to see that that demonstrated impact which I think is a totally reasonable thing to, to want and to need and I think one of the things too that for the art sector for everywhere else I think there's a real opportunity to change the metrics and, and sort of the KPIs about how we talk about success, because I think it's often been quite reductive around numbers through the door and postcodes. And I think with, you know, within the sort of framework of some of these bigger trends, there's a real, I think we need to be going back to like participation models and depth of immersion and, and social impact scales and, and all of these other ways to really consider how we are um, having an impact and measuring success. Um, yeah, that's, if we could get away from kind of metrics of through the door, that would be a huge start, I think. But, you know, the, but the people feel that, that their money is, that they are seeing benefit for it is really critical. Yeah. And if I can just add to that trend in terms of funding, um, uh, you know, the last two years have in their own quiet way been quite revolutionary uh, because the RISE funding uh, is not a small program. It's, it's about as much as the Australia Council gives away in a normal year. Um, uh, including the money that it gives to the, major, to the um, national partnership organisation. So it's a very substantial fund. Uh, and for the first time, that has really and genuinely been opened up to commercial producers. So historically, we've had this big divide between public arts companies, not-for-profits, professional, but receiving substantial public subsidy, and commercial... Um, uh, producers often in popular music or popular music and musicals, um, commercial for profit and receiving no public subsidy at all. The bottom line is the public shows up to both of them. Uh, much the same kind of people appear on stage on both of them, and definitely the same kind of people appear in the pit. Um, uh, but we've had this big divide, and that has really changed in the last two years. And I think that that may well be something that changes more for the longer term as well. Uh, and of course, it's also changed quite substantially in terms of how it's administered. So historically, the Commonwealth's money, at least, has been administered, handed out, if you like, through the um, Australia Council. Uh, for the last two years, all of the RISE funding has, at least as a matter of formality, 
come from uh, the department. Now, it's in fact probably a great deal more arm's length than many other um, uh, grant programs that the Commonwealth Government has been running. And I don't need to say any more about that. We've all read about that in the papers. Um, but it is quite a significant shift uh, as well. It's, um, you know, the cynical might describe it uh, as the catalyst fund that you have when you're not taking money away from the Australia Council at the same time. Um, and that's effectively uh, what the RISE funding has done. It's, it's created money that is um, being administered, you know, under manifestly different criteria, given that it's now going, at least in material part, to commercial producers. And, and I, I suspect with a more, um, uh, more of an eye to ensuring that um, the art really does get seen by as many people as possible. Excellent, thank you. Now I can see there's lots of questions coming in in the um, Q&A function, so we'll turn to those in just a moment. But before we do, one more question for our panellists. a and talks a lot about a 21st century approach. Looking to the future, what does a 21st century approach mean to you? And Joe, your first cab off the rank on this one. Look, I'm afraid I'm just going to like reel off a whole lot of buzzwords to you, Kate, but I suppose, again, coming back to where I sit in terms of, you know, working with audiences, working with young people, a lot of my lessons and a lot of the ways that I think about the future and about engaging and having these conversations, it's really about transparency and kind of positive risk taking, actually, and I think um, being able to find, to be responsive to situations and adaptable. And I think really trying to, um, you know, decenter ideas of, of like where, the, who holds the power and who gets to tell the story and, and partnerships. I really think there is, there's a real future in terms of those cross-sector partnerships, collaboration um, and knowledge exchange. So that's, that's what I am hoping for, for the 21st century way of, of moving forward. Thank you. Kara, what does a 21st century approach mean to you? Um, a 21st century approach to me means uh, if there's a national cultural plan, that that plan, uh, if I could wave a wand, would be looking at seven generations at least worth of thinking and action. Um, I think we need to stop thinking about 12 months and five years worth of plans. It's not enough. Um, particularly with the kinds of work we're looking to this industry in the creative industries with this kind of cultural plan, with the big picture partnership models. Um, you know, the paper talks about partnerships or the way I've kind of interpreted it and looking at embedding in ideas of infrastructure around the country. Um, uh, a lot like the kind of green, the green era I'm thinking about where creatives could be, in fact, I think really quite handy in making whatever that future looks like to be aesthetically excellent um, alongside very practical. Um, I think that there's, for me also, uh, there's a very CACD, a cultural and community development embedded idea in here because we need to think, um, and what I've picked up from uh, is that this middle Australia kind of um, thinking and the language uh, needs to be, less art form specific and more creative industries. And it's going back to that idea, I think I spoke about, about um, experiences and entertainment over um, excellence alone and the pursuit of excellence. Um, I think the other thing I was thinking about is that a cultural plan would be hugely beneficial as a key to finding what this shared language is because we don't do a good enough job yet of explaining ourselves and our relevance. And I think we've got a lot of work to do in, in terms of taking our um, energy and our optimism into those other sectors to in fact be able to embed that kind of change that we wanna see. Um, so that's, that's kind of off the top of my head. And oh, except for one other thing is that I think we need to go back to this idea of STEAM and ins inserting the arts back into our STEM. I think that um, we need a future where uh, this, this creativity, this responsiveness, this critical thinking, um, the collaboration and all the things we get from social and emotional learning um, needs to be embedded for our future work capacity. I'm, I'm thinking about in 20 years time when we're looking at big issues around the Pacific, 
what does that mean for a soft, soft diplomacy and our skills in communication? And what does it be look like um, for us being able to manufacture our own goods? I think we've nearly, well, my assumption here is, is that we've outsourced a lot of our manufacturing, including our intelligence out outside. We, we're gonna have to pull that back and we're gonna need some very big um, steamy efforts to get that back in and under our own captaincy, I think. And the trophy for the best use of the word steamy in a conversation goes to Cara. John, 21st century approach, what does that mean to you? Well, you know, predictions about the future are very hard. <laughs> uh, if I look at the really big trends in our politics, um, there's an increasing focus on inequality with all the stuff that Piketty has done. Uh, there is an increasing focus on community. Um, and, you know, if nothing else, COVID has really focused on, on that, the importance of community, the, the importance of human relationships, the importance of local communities, you know, geographically defined communities, as well as online communities and all the other communities that we have. Uh, and there's also a trend back towards worrying about institutions. Um, uh, you know, events in, in the United States in January have reminded us that economics is not everything, not even close to being everything, uh, and that institutions really matter. So I don't know whether it is a prediction about the future, but I hope that our 21st century arts will reflect all of those trends. So it will take concerns about equity much more seriously and ensure that people really are engaged. Uh, and ironically, the places with the lowest incomes in Australia are also probably the places with the least access to arts and also the places where access to the arts is least talked about. And that's essentially the outer suburbs of our big cities. Um, they are, those are in fact the places where incomes are lowest in Australia. So we'd worry about inequality. Um, we would worry about our institutions. Um, and a lot of our arts institutions haven't changed very much in 30 years but the ethnic makeup of the country has changed radically. Um, and I don't think our institutions reflect that. You know, we have um, a world leading um, uh, Western Classical Music Academy that I have the privilege of being a chair, the chair of. Uh, we have nothing as far as I'm aware of that receives any serious public funding in um, any of the um, uh, musical traditions of Asia, which are, you know, deep and interesting and, uh, important musical traditions. And there are a very large number of people in Australia who come from those traditions. So we would take those institutions seriously, more seriously than we have. Uh, and we would take the community more seriously. Um, Cara talked about um, the community arts. And I think that, that we've had this really big divide between public arts on the one hand and the commercial arts on the other and, and community arts. And, you know, none of them really have talked as much to each other as they might have. And I think that that's an opportunity that's gone begging. Uh, and those community arts are really important. They're really big. There's a lot of them. Uh, and actually most of it's flown under the radar, ironically, because it's not a cultural industry. Nobody gets paid. That's kind of not the point. Um, or at least not very many people get paid. Some do, and that's that's fine. But but the vast majority of the participants don't want to be paid, don't expect to be paid. They do it because they enjoy it. Um, and it's been very that that part of arts and culture has been almost invisible from our um, arts policy making for art for a long time. And I think that too needs to change. So there's there's three big trends around equity, um, around um, uh, institutions and around community. Uh, I'd hope that that's what the 21st century brings, but you know, who knows? Excellent, thank you. I'm going to turn now to some of the questions uh, that have come in. Now, first up, I love this is I love this idea of cross for, cross portfolio engagement of arts and creativity. Do you think that this is understood across different industries, across levels of government, et cetera? So the question there is, do you think that this idea of cross portfolio engagement is understood across different industries and understood across different levels of government? 
I'm going to um, hand that one, bounce that one back to you, John. Um, so in my experience of, of working for government, um, we were definitely all playing the same game, uh, but it wasn't clear to me that the departments were all playing for the same team. <laughs> and, and in a sense, that's one of the geniuses of how our government is set up. It's actually designed a bit like that so that, you know, your Treasury worries about whether or not you've got enough money and your Health and Community Services Department or whatever it's called, you know, worries about, you know, what's this going to do for people who don't have any money and, and so on. So there is actually a certain logic to setting things up like that. I think one of the fundamental challenges is that for an education department, no matter how compelling the case might be that, you know, arts and culture has a, an, an important impact on children's learning, you know, relative to rolling out their new teacher performance feedback model, you know, it's just never going to make top of the list. Um, and the same is true in the health department. And, you know, there's a certain logic to that. Um, so I think that's the really big challenge for, for joint arts policy is that, you know, inevitably departments responsible for everything you know basically the whole system collapses in a heap you have to specialize you have to have responsibilities so that's the challenge i don't think it's insurmountable i think we can definitely do better than we have been um but i think we need to look the challenges in the face and and, and say look it's they are they are hard constraints they're there for a reason um and so just sort of saying well we want it all to be joined up and you know wouldn't it be good um you have to be more thoughtful than that because there are real problems that are, in a funny way, they're there for good reasons. Excellent. Thanks, John. Now, Cara, I'm going to bring this next question to you, and it's a little bit of a long one. So it feels like the redemocratisation of arts is well underway, but it is a slow process as those that control many of the institutions don't want to change from the more elitist or intellectual approach. One of the biggest problems seems to be that of language. If you would have told me as an 18 to 20 year, 18 to concerts and movies regularly and devouring books. How do we best change people's perceptions of what arts and culture is? So long question there. How do we best change people's perceptions of what arts and culture is? I'll start back at the front end of that um, question statement, which was the word read democracy, uh, that one, that's big word, um, speaking of language. Um, the democratization of these institutions and in our industries, I think, is about the uh, equity and justice um, work that's, that is in this report as well. Um, and it's, it came out of um, Australia Council reports. It's, it's, it's all over the shop. And I think it goes back to this idea that um, you touched on it, John, that, you know, even in regional communities or in the big, in, with the big cats in town, We've got um, the population, ethnic population, the culturally diverse population is not represented in leadership and decision making of the very places that we are seeking to see ourselves reflected. Um, so firstly, it's got to be about who's making the decisions and we need to see, um, I think, as part of the cultural plan um, or any move forward, we've got to see a, a balance um, of who is making decisions for whom and by whom. Um, that will then, I think, in turn, start to shift the language. I think part of, you know, working cross-culturally, I would say my entire career, I spend most of my time trying to alleviate people's fear of words and language all the time, using the word Aboriginal or using the word Indigenous, which one should I be or use, all the things. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot in that question about um, the language uh, work that we've got to do. Um, the idea too about democratising um, cross industry for me is very important. And that's coming back to this shared language where I think that as collaborators um, and as creatives or people who understand it are inherently um, collaborative. Um, it's all about initiative and curiosity, um, adaptability and all these kinds of ingredients that we've already got going on that we actually need to go out and be a little bit fearless 
ourselves to kind of try and persuade and influence other sectors about how cool this stuff really is and will be for them. Uh, because I think irrespective, and I, you know, having worked in some um, very inflexible public services from time to time, um, they also really enjoy what we offer in the creative um, space around the kinds of use of language or interpretive dance or whatever gets that policy across the line for you in your workplace. But um, it comes back to me about the, the equity and justice work we've got to do about recalibrating who's making decisions and how we can embed that into a cultural plan that has a long-term investment because it's not a short shift, that particular piece of work. Excellent, thank you. Now we've got a couple of minutes left for questions and I'm going to be sending this one to you, Joe. So uh, there's a question there um, that we'd love to have the panel talk about the interplay of a national cultural plan with the decision-making and cultural investment at a local community level, e.g. local government. Councils are struggling to understand priorities in their communities right across the spectrum from roads to sustainable environments to cultural issues. And Joe, I know that you have um, a lot of experience working um, with particular communities um, within institutions and how I'm keen to hear from you how navigating that interplay of a kind of a big, um, a big strategy or a big institution um, and how that connects to um, how you've worked at connecting that to the aspirations of a particular community in, you know, a minute and a half. Right. Um, well, I think, I mean, I think it really builds on, on the previous question about how do we change people's perceptions about what arts and culture is. And I think that's really from, I mean, to speak to quite a specific example, um, working with a youth committee within an institution who are responsible for that programming and for their peers and for saying, this is what art is and, and we're going to reflect your experiences and your lives back to you and we're going to create space for you to come in and navigate and decide for yourself what this means. And one of the things that um, at the MCA Australia, this Gen Next, which was their flagship youth program, we developed a program called Gen Next Goes West where we actually took the youth committee and they would partner with um, West and Southwestern Sydney arts organisations who in turn had their own groups of young people. And it was really about creating those spaces to, um, to share and exchange knowledge, to have that peer to peer learning and to build up confidence. And I think from that experience, you know, for a lot of young people, that was their first encounter with arts and culture. And I think really recognising that transformative things can happen on a grassroots level with not a lot of money, if there's just a recognition of, of meeting people where they're at and really ensuring that there's space for their experiences to be to be heard. And, you know, we did a lot of research into the impact of participating in this program. And we found that it, you know, it, it improved people's sense of well-being. They felt seen there, um, that they felt that these, these spaces that were by them and for them at a really kind of community level, whether it was at MCA in the Rocks or at Casula Powerhouse, you know, they felt that it was a safe and welcoming environment, um, you know, and, and one of the most diverse communities of young people ever through that real listening and that invitation and recognising people's expertise in, in where they are. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, but it is a really complex thing. And I think actually local governments do a lot of heavy lifting on the ground with community groups and organizations and, you know, Bankstown Arts Centre hosts Tai Chi as well as, you know, a, a, a whole lot of things, you know, urban theatre projects and contemporary art projects. So there are these, there's spaces, particularly at local government level where people can come and, and have that, that conversation, start those conversations. I'm not sure if I've answered the question. I feel like I've, but I've, I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's a pretty huge question. You it's did a great job. job. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So we're coming to the end of our time together today and to wrap up, I'd like to say a few things. Uh, last week, a stranger asked me what the big goal was for a new approach. And I spoke first about the idea of a national plan for arts, culture and creativity, which you have of course heard about today. But I also sh shared with them another goal that through our work, we can help a much wider range of people be considered in and be able to contribute to the conversations about public policy for arts and culture. 
so that those public policies would consider a lot, a lot more people and how arts and culture plays in their lives. And that public policy for arts and culture would serve a contemporary Australian public. And I think we've heard a lot today um, about the need to serve a contemporary um, version of Australia um, now and into the future. That is what I hope for in our future, a public policy approach to arts and culture that honours the relevance and significance of arts and culture in the lives of people right across the country, whether they are an obliging dance school concert goer or a dedicated creator pushing the boundaries, whether they are someone singing along with the radio or a curator grappling with how to tell a new story about Australia. All of those are part of a cultural life that emboldens us, all of those and much more. So most importantly, I'd like to say thank you to you, to everyone who has joined us today. I know it can be quite tricky to look to the future at the moment. And we really appreciate you taking this hopeful action by joining this session today and being part of expanding that conversation. A particular thank you to our panelists, John, Kara and Joe, and to Rupert for his opening remarks. And a shout out to the ANA staff who've put today together. A reminder to join the mailing list so that the new analysis report, 21st Century Priorities for an Australian Arts and Cultural Policy, um, will be in your inbox tomorrow. Thank you so much for your time today, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Goodbye.